and I will share educational content ranging from mathematics to accounting. Hello guys, you are welcome back to Labby Premium Concepts. On this channel, we share educational content ranging from mathematics to accounting. Hello guys, you are welcome back to Labby Premium Concepts. On this channel, we share educational content ranging from mathematics to accounting. Hi, right, so welcome back once again to our live session today. So today it is actually it's going to be in two divisions. We're going to look at simple compound interest and promising notes, right? Explain the concept behind that, and then later discuss practice question in relation to that. So that's what we're going to do today. So if you just join us, do all to like, subscribe to the channel, most importantly, share the video to as many students as possible. Who may be interested in this kind of TV videos? I hope I can be heard loud and clear. Please, I hope I can be heard loud and clear. I hope I can be heard loud and clear. Okay, so that is fine. If you just join us, do want to share the video so that others will join in, in that case. So today, as I say, we are going to look at it's going to be in a two section form. We look at the idea or the bag knowledge behind simple and compound interest and as well promissory notes and later solve some practical questions. So that's going to be what we're going to do for today. So that is what we need to know. So let's take note of that. So we are, we are first of all looking at what simple interest. Simple interest. So we are going to look at simple interest as a beginning concept, okay? So what is a simple interest? When we talk about simple interest by the name, it is what? Simple, right? Here, it has to do with a form of a loan that actually one person will lend to another person, okay? One person will lend to another person, and at the end of the day, the person who lends that loan to the other person will charge what? An interest, or will allow the person who borrowed the loan from the other person to pay a fee in addition to the amount that he borrows. When it happens like that, then, we have what a simple word, interest, all right? So 
let's get that's the simplest place you can get for simple interest so that is what we Paul that's why we need to understand come to simple interest we are talking about two parties let's say we have party a let's say we have part a and then party b right and part a will actually will borrow or will lend money toward party b so we'll lend money to party b we call party a as what the 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 payee or most of the times you can call it as the payee or we call it as what the creditor the creditor of the loan right yeah and then we call party b as what the borrower party b is also called what the borrower the borrower or the data of the loan right so these are the things that we need to not come to a simple interest so at the end of the day part a will actually borrowed part a will actually lens that's the right way to party b who is actually the borrower and at the end of the day we expect that part b will pay to part a the amount that he lends, we call that as well the initial amount. We call that as a principal plus the fee that he pays for the money that he lends to Part B. Because assuming that if Part A actually lends the money to Part B, Part A could have actually used the money for other business, and that will have generated interest. So that's how come once we lend a loan, you expect that you must pay the fee to actually cover what we should have used the money to do for which we are getting an interest but remember resources are scarce so once we use it we expect that we get what an interest on the usage of it so let's be guided so the fee is what we call the interest or we call that what the simple word, interest so let's be guided about that so now we know what is a principal so we have principal we, we have talked about principal you're talking about interest or let me hint on it once again when we talk about principal the principal is actually what the initial loan the initial amount that is borrowed the initial amount that is borrowed by one party from another when we talk about the interest the interest has to do with the fee the fee that the one who borrowed the money the borrower must pay together with the principal to the lender when it is what due so you're talking about what due date when it is due or when the time comes for the loan to be paid then we are talking about due date or the maturity value of what the loan so in that we cannot talk about what time because whenever you're talking about due date, then we can also talk about what time. So time has to do with what the period, right, for which the borrower is expected to make the payment. As and when due. And the payment is expected to make should be the composition of what the principal plus what the interest. And that will give us what we call our maturity value or the future value. So when we talk about maturity value or future value, it has to do with what the initial amount that was granted plus the fee that the borrower must pay in order in, together with the initial amount so that at the end of the day the the lender will actually also end an interest of the amount that he borrowed to the borrower or he lends sorry he lends to the borrower that is the right way that we need to use in this particular case so that is the whole issue when it comes to a simple interest so by computation if you have any question you can drop in the comment section just join us do want to share the video and like it as well so that others will join us in that case so by computation we can say that simple interest si is equal to is how we compute for simple interest so we are talking about principal we are talking about interest we are talking about time we can also well talk about what the rate actually because the rate is actually the interest so rate is also another element and a simple interest arrangement between two parties who are what the payee or the creditor and then the borrower or the data is that okay so we have what the rate so the rate actually stipulates the percentage amount that must be paid together with the principal which is the loan that we're going to pay at the maturity date or the maturity word, uh, period right and once we pay the principal plus the interest we get a maturity value or the future value in that line Okay, so the rate is actually the percentage that is going to be given. Most like can be given percentage can be given in the form of what a proportion, a ratio, or I mean can be in a fraction, percentage, or even decimal. It depends on the nature of the question. You can get as rate, and then all that you must do is to use the rate to calculate for your simple interest. 
Okay, so once you have gotten that, then we can actually come out with a formula for defining simple interest. So we we'll say that simple interest, this is how we define simple by mathematical term. Mathematically, simple interest is equal to our principal multiplying the rate in percentage multiplying with time. Immediately, I use here to be a percentage. Then we know that percentage is out of 100, so I won't divide by 100. But immediately, you said that, or we can talk about alternative here, or simple interest is equal to the principal multiplying the rate multiplying the time without the percentage attached to the r then we will say that you must divide all by what 100 it's actually the same so whenever you see this the same thing as this so once the percentage is here the same thing as out of what 100 so let's be guided about that so that is the way that we actually compete for a simple interest so let's be let's take note of that so let's try this question then also look at some other ways that we can compute interest depends on the period under which actually the terms of the agreement is actually engaged on so now we know that a simple interest has to do with what an amount that must be paid in addition to the initial amount that was what lent from one party to another as a fee for the usage of what the resources of the one who actually lent the money to the one who borrowed it that becomes what the simple interest so that's what we need to understand going forward please share the video and like it as well do all to share the video and like it as well so this is how we compete for simple interest in that case so we have principal multiplying the rate multiplying time you divide by 100 or principal multiplying the rate which is percentage you attach percentage to the rate and then multiplying with the time so this is what we need to understand going forward. So let's try this question and see how far we can actually explain the concept better. So you can clearly see that simple interest is actually computed what once. We compute simple interest what just once, irrespective of the amount and the period we compute it what once. So if you could actually can see from here, let me show you this uh, my diagram here. I hope you can see this. You see, simple interest is actually. I hope you can see this arrow. Let me try to zoom it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this kind of uh, dot here. That shows that simple interest is always what, will, when you plot it on a graph, will have what a straight line, like a face course line, right? It's going to be a straight line, actually. Mine is not straight. So it's actually telling us that. When we compete for simple interest, we compute it just once, irrespective of the period. If it is three years, four years, five years, just once, and that is all. But when we get to the offset, you understand that interest can be computed more than once. And that will lead us to the compound word, uh, interest. We'll get the very soon. So let's continue. So we are asked to use this as illustration to compute. Compute for, so we're asked to compute example one. We are asked to compute for a loan of $1,000, right? A loan of $1,000, a loan of $1,000, which is, which is payable, which is payable, which is payable in three years, time with an annual rate with an annual rate of okay sorry let me okay i'm coming with an annual rate of let's say 10 percent so you should compute for actually or let me go by this way come in well, let's go by the same approach so compute for a simple interest i think that's how it should be a simple interest of a simple interest with a loan of what ten thousand dollars which is payable in three years time with an annual rate of what ten percent so how do you compute for this so you have what the initial amount being the principal and we have what the time which is three years and we have the annual rate of what 10 percent so how are we going to compete for the simple interest so in computing for simple interest we'll say that si should be equal to the principal multiplying the rate multiplying what time right 
So we know that the principal is the loan, which is what? $1,000, okay? And then multiply by the rate, which is what? 10%. Remember, this is what per annum uh, information. Assuming it was given the time, or we're asked, I think when we get to com compound interest, you appreciate the periods better. But for now, let's take it like that. So we have $1,000 multiplying 10%. Cost are you attached per, uh, percentage to the 10. That's why not dividing by 100. And then multiply by the time, which is what? Three. So what are we getting? What are we getting at the end of the day? So here, I know that I can still express this as what? 1,000 multiplying 10 out of 100 multiplying what? Three. So the three, the two zeros can count to the two zero, right? So I'm left with 10 here. Multiplying 10 is going to give me what? And the right multiplying three, then we are getting 300. So, meaning that our simple interest is what 300. So, once you get a simple, that is fine. But let's also use hypothetically that the question also asks us to compute for the maturity value. Compute for the maturity value. How, how will you also compete for that? So, we'll say that maturity value, maturity value, we also the same thing as the future value should be equal to the initial amount with the principal plus what? The simple interest, okay? So here, we know that the simple interest is what? The initial amount is what? $1,000, right? And now we get an interest of what? 300. So therefore, the amount that's supposed to be paid at the end of three years should be what? 1,300. And this is how we compute for simple interest and the maturity value of any loan arrangement between two parties if you have any question you can let me know going forward so let's take note of that now we can also look at some other ways some other contemporary ways we can also compute for simple interest looking at the time period looking at the time period looking at the time period we also have other ways to compute for simple interest looking at the time period and what are they so Actually, when it comes to computation of simple interest, looking at the time period, we have two methods, and these are the exact, these are the exact, and then the ordinary. These are the exact, and then the ordinary. All right, so we have exact, and then the ordinary. So we have exact time, as I said, we have the exact time, and we have what? The ordinary time of computing for simple interest, okay? That is based on the time, you are supposed to make payments, all right? So when we talk about the exact time, the exact time is saying that, hey, when it comes to computation of simple interest, here I make use of what, three, six, five days, or I make use of what, three, six, six days, if it is what, a leap year. So whether three, six, five days is a normal year, or three, six, six is what, a leap year, right? So that is the exact time approach so whenever you're competing for simple interest always the denominator of your time is going to be whether 365 or 366 if they actually throw more light that the condition for this in terms of the time it was actually what leap year then use three sixes because there's that time but if it is an ordinary then that is what opposite the ordinary says that here i'll assume that for each month we have what 360 days and that is all. I assume that each month we have 360 days. And as such, in computation of my simple interest, the time factor going to consider in terms of days, the denominator should be what? 360 days. It should be 360 days. So that is the whole deal when it comes to the exact time and then the ordinary way of what computing based on the time duration. Okay, so let's take note of that. So here we have the exact time and we have what the ordinary. The exact go for 365 is a normal year. Then the if it is a leap year, go for three success. If it is an ordinary, then the assumption here is that each month go for 30 days. And then how many months do you have in a year? 12 months or so 12 multiplying 30. What are we getting? We are getting 360 days, right? So that is the whole approach in that line. So we can even make use of our first question here where we're asked to compute for simple interest of a loan of $1,000, which is payable. So assuming that they wouldn't have said three years, but they will say that compute for a simple interest of a loan, which is payable within, let's say, which is payable within, let's say, let me try to copy this question if it's possible. Uh, let's see. 
let's see if it is possible. Um, okay, I think it's possible. So let me bring it here. So I was that the question I've said that instead of payable in three years, I've said that let's say, which is payable in let's say, within let's say 180 days. Instead of three years, the question I've said 180 days, exact time, 180 days, exact time. Then we are talking about the exact method of computation of simple interest. And what will have been your response? That will have been that your simple interest should be equal to right here is going to be your principal multiplying the same rate multiplying what the time but in this case or divided by what 100 because of the percentage but in this case because you have been given the days this are going to be you're going to have a initial mass the principal to be thousand dollars and since you are asked to use the exact time then we know the number of days that we are asked to use so it's going to be multiplying the rate of what what will be the rate here it's just 10 percent Okay, and then multiplying the time in this case it should be what 180 days divided by since you are talking about exact then we are using what 365. Well, we weren't actually giving any other information that the year is what a leap year. So we just use what 365. And then whatever you get will become what your simple interest. And that will have been the exact time of computation of simple interest. Okay, but the question is to have said that let's say. Instead of 180 at that time, question I'll say, let's say 180 ordinary time. And that will have been what 180 divided by what 360, and you are done. So that is the two approach when it comes to the contemporary way of computing for simple interest based on the time period of making the payment by the borrower. If you have any question, you can let me know going forward. So this is what we need to understand going forward as computation of what simple interest. Okay, so once you also know the the general way of computing for simple interest, we know the exact time, we know the approximate, we know the exact time, and we know the ordinary method. We can also as well determine, in terms of exact time and then the ordinary, how we can also compute for the due date for a particular what loan, assuming that's been given in what in days, right? We can also as well do that. We can also as well do that. I hope I can be heard loud and clear. I hope I can be heard loud and clear. Okay, so in that line too, we also have two approaches when it comes to due date computation. Come on, when it comes to due date computation, right? Due date, we have two approaches that go by that, right? In that we have exact time, and we also have approximate time. So when it comes to the method of computation of simple interest, the two contemporary method of computation which are based on the time period has to do with the ordinary method and then the exact method. But when it comes to the calculation of due date, we also have what exact time and approximate time. Exact time and approximate time. So here we have exact time. And then we also have second one, the approximate the approximate the approximate time and what are we talking about here when we talk about the exact time the idea here is that here it works the same way as what computation of what the exact method of computation for simple interest so the idea here is that we are going for what three six five days or three six six days if it is a leap year right but if you are talking about approximate, then it's also dealing with what the ordinary. The assumption here is that each month goes for 30 days, and then for a year, we must have what 360 days. So let's keep in mind that when it comes to computation of due date, based on the requirement of the question, you may be given the exact time or the approximate time. If it's approximate, then 360 days. If it's exact time, then we have 365 days or 366 days. So let's be guided about this going forward. So how do you also calculate due date in that line? Let's say we're giving what a loan as an organization. We went to bank and we're giving a loan and they told us that the loan is supposed to be paid within what? Let's say 60 days. Within 60 days. Within 60 days. Within, let me write it for within 60 days. Please share the video, okay? Within 60 days. Okay, there is a period that we have been given. But here lies the case. We are told that this is 60 days exact time. We are asked to compute for the due date 
for 60 days as that time for which the loan date we know the loan date was given to us as what let's say how should i even say let's say 15th january 15th january so the loan date was given as what 15 january that is the loan date so we have the loan date to be equal to 15th january and we have for 60 days to make what the payment that will be the due date and we are saying that here we are asked to calculate the due date based on the exact time or approach so the assumption is that that time goes for what three six five days being the normal year or three six six days a leap year right but since we are not told whether it is a leap year or a normal year then the idea here is that we are using what the normal which is what three six five days so in computation of due date then we we'll say that due date if you can remember when we're discussing trade discounts where we talk about the discount period the due date the those issues if you can remember we develop the fastest way to calculate due date that's the same print going to use here okay so in calculating for due date then we said that it should be 15th of what january okay plus 60 days plus what 60 days plus 60 days okay so once you get this that's fine so it is the simplest way we can get for our due date the loan date was 15 january and we have 60 days to pay which is what the exact time so the idea here is that for the normal period with the exact time each month will carry its own normal time so if it is january 31st if it is february then 28th if it is march 31st if it's april it's april 30th or 31st depends on the line you can also think through june and i mean if it is that time then we are using the normal days in the month but if it's an approximate time january will be 30 february will be 30 march will be 30 to december all of them will be 30 that is the assumption but since we are asked to calculate the due date for the exact time then here the simplest way to go is to just deal with the numbers okay so when i add 15 plus 60 what am i getting i'm getting 75 right once i get that that is fine the next question i'll ask myself is that the next question i'll ask myself is that which month was the loan contracted which month was the loan contracted in other words what is the loan date that was in what in january right so i asked myself every question again that how many days do you have in what january how many days do you have in january and you will tell me that's what 31 days so this is what i will do i'll have my 75 now subtract 31 from 75 what am i getting four and i'm getting here what four so i'm left with 44 days which is what greater than every normal days you should have in a month so once i'm done with january what is the next month after january that is what february right and a february in exact normal time will have for 28 days so this is what i will do i'll continue to subtract again so i'll have 44 minus what 28 so what am i getting here here is 14 right i'll just draw the four away left with 10 when i subtract h from 10 i'm left with 2 so i'll add the four back which is what 6 and here i'll be left with 3 okay so when i take 2 from three i'm left with one so that will mean that once we actually took the general of 31 and we also subtracted that of what february on we are left with 16 days which we can say it is what an a normal day that can be within a particular what, month and from january february you are moving on towards march right so that means that the due date for this loan should be what should be 16th march should be 16th march 16th march 16th march so that is the whole approach when it comes to computation of what due date don't be counting your hand when you do that you waste time in examination condition just be playing with the numbers add the numbers once you get the total you ask yourself which month was the loan contracted you ask yourself another question again how many days are in the month then once you get to know you subtract and once the number of the data is left still is greater than the normal days we must have in the month you continue to deal with the next month and you subtract so you get a day or a number of days that is within a normal days for a particular what month and you get your answer in that line let's also try another example question here or will you try this for me let me see in the comment section let's say we have a loan date of let's say a loan date of like say uh 14th 14th of february okay that's the loan date that is the loan date 
it is 14th of April, right? It's war. It is not fair. So loan date. I hope I can be heard loud and clear. Loan date is what? 14th of February. Can I be heard? Let me put in some comments here. I hope I can be heard loud and clear. So I know that I'm not talking. I'm not having any waste in my section. Let me see in the comments if I can be heard loud and clear then. Let me see in the comment section. Okay, so we have a loan date of what? 14th of February. Okay, and then we have been given 120 days approximate time. Approximate time. So we are asked to compute for the due date. We are asked to compute for the due date. Here we have been given what? The approximate time. So the approximate time here, the underlying year word here is that the line here where it is that we are dealing with what 360 what days each month go for 30 days and we are dealing with what 360 days in a year thank you so much uh thank you Marily. okay that's fine okay so here in calculating the due date since you are using our approximate time which is 30 days in a year 30 days in each month then we will say that due date should be what 14th of february okay plus what 120 days 120 days okay so we just have to play with the number so we have 14 plus what 120 so we have 120 plus what 14 so what are we getting for we have here three we have here one three four so once you get one three four that becomes our total number of days that we have as it stands now so we ask ourselves which month are we in or which month was the loan contracted that is what 14th of february right so since we are dealing with the approximate time the assumption here is that february will be 30 the next month will be 30 so we'll be subtracting 30, 30 till we get a normal days that can fall within a particular period and i hope that is clear all right so here the assumption here is that february is what 30 days so we'll subtract 30 from here so what are we getting we are left with what 104 okay so after february since one of 104 is not an, an, an is an abnormal number of days in it a month we continue to subtract so from february move on towards march right so we have what 104 march also be 30 right so we have what four here here will be 10 so when i subtract 3 from 10 i'm getting what seven and here is zero so zero so i'm left with 74 how many 74 is also have normal number of days in the month so from march i'll move on towards april how many days do you have in april that is 30 right and remember here too you are using approximate time so don't even think about number of days your idea is that you are subtracting 30 trials so here we're getting what here was what february right and here march so next 74 minus 30 we have for we have 44 that's going to what april okay so we are left with 44 which is also a normal number of days in the month so from april we move on towards may so May is also 30 because of the approximate time. Subtract 30 from your left with 4, your left with 40. So meaning that based on the approximate time, our due date for this is going to be 14th of what? May. 14th of May and you are done. So that is the principle behind the exact time and then the due time calculation of what due date. So let's take note of that. Let's take note of that. So that is the whole idea when it comes to the simple interest. So now let's zoom to talk about compound interest. If you have any question, you can drop it in the comment section. We'll have to take the discussion further to look at compound interest and later discuss promissory notes. So let's talk about compound interest. Any question so far? Any, any question? If you have any question, let me know. Okay. Silence me is concerned. They get in. Come on. I'm trying to pull it. So move it a bit. Silence me is concerned. Then we are okay. Let's move on. Come on. So let's talk about compound interest. We just 
discuss simple interest. We say simple interest is what an interest are computed once on the principal, irrespective of the number of years under consideration. But when it comes to compound interest, it's opposite. Here, interests are computed on interest. So we call it interest upon interest. Interest upon interest. So whilst when we plot a simple interest in a graph form, right? When we plot simple interest in the graph form, let's say this our simple interest and this our principal or the initial amount. You realize that since interest is computed one is going to be a straight line that will be parallel towards the principal line. But when it comes to the compound interest, when it comes to the compound interest, you are plotting this on a curve. So here you have compound interest and your principal. It's not going to be a straight line, but rather, since you are computing interest upon interest, that's going to be what? Going to be a curve. It's going to be what? A directly proportional curve, right? That people can also call it as what? In economic term, as what? More of like a supply curve, right? So it's going to be something like this. Something like this. It's going to be something like this, a curve. So as and when our uh, principal actually increases our simple interest sorry our compound interest also increases in that line so as and when it increases compound interest also what increases so that is the idea behind what the compound interest so compound interest means interest upon interest right so here we calculate interest more than what once but when it comes to simple interest interest is computed just what once so Let's take note of that. So when it comes to the computation of it, because of the nature of compound interest, and since we are computing interest upon interest, then we have developed a formula that can easily help you to actually calculate a compound interest for a particular number of years, irrespective of the period. So we we'll say that compound interest you, we'll talk about the future value first. So in determining compound interest, this is the whole approach. It's equal to our future value, minus what the principal or the loan or the loan amount how do you get our future value in compound interest how do you get so that will help us to get our compound what interest now let's see in calculating for our future value which is the same thing as what the maturity value let's take note that future value the maturity value the amount that is supposed to pay at the end of the due date right so your future value should be equal to our future value should be equal to by compound interest. We have a formula which is what principal into bracket one, and I will explain these parameters plus r over what hundred all to the power n. And let's take this discussion a bit further. What is p? The p stands for what? Or let's start from the fv, which is what the future value. So the fv stands for the future what value? The future value. Or the maturity also the same as the maturity value. The P stands for the principal. Okay. The one is a constant actually. R is also the periodic word interest. Periodic interest. Please take note of this. Very important. Periodic interest. And then N is the number of times to be compounded. The number of times, number of times compounded, let's say, let's put it in that way, number of times compounded, number of times compounded. Now, let's explain this further by using formulas in that line. We know that how to calculate our future value is what? Principal into bucket one plus r all over 100 or to the power n. Now, we know that, so that one is fine. Principal is also be given in the question, so that is fine. We can also call the principal as also what the present value. So you don't see principal, you can also see what present value. So instead of P here, you can also see what PV as the present value is the same thing. So don't get confused when you see that. So whether the present value or the principal or the initial amount or the loan, they are the same thing. Is that okay? Right. So the principal has also be given in the question. So that, that's what constitutes the arrangement, actually, the loan itself. And the periodic interest rate, periodic interest rate, here too, it also has to do with what the rate that we actually charge based on the period we are compounding. So in compound interest, we had of compounding, compounding, compounding. So let's take the discussion for that. How do, you, how do you compete for what a periodic interest rate? Let's say, for example, we're given an annual rate of, let's say, 12%. These are annual rates. So always in the question, you'll be given an annual rate of what? Annual rate or 
12% per annum means that it's an annual rate, right, of 12%. And the question says that based on this arrangement of the loan, it is compounded, say, semi-annually. It is compounded, say, semi-annually. For every year, you must pay what? 12%. Now we are compounded semi-annually. You ask yourself, how many semi-annuals do you have in a year? Which is what? Two. Okay? Which is two. So meaning that for us to get semi-annual rate, then we'll say that R should be equal to the annual rate divided by what? Two. Because we are dealing with what? Compounding semi-annual. And we have two semi-annuals in a year. So for us to get a periodic interest rate, that should be what? 12 divided by 2. And we are getting what? 6%. So this is how we compute for what? The periodic rate. So depends on the compounding periods. Depends on the compounding periods. We can do that. If let's say we are asked to uh, compound, let's say, quarterly based on this 12% annum rate, then that will have been what? Annual rate divided by what? 4. Because we have 4 quarters in, the, in a year. So we divide by 4, so we get our periodic what, interest rate. If we were to be monthly, then we will have, say, 12% divided by 12, and we get our periodic interest what, rate. So this is what we need to understand when it comes to the periodic interest rate. Okay? And the number of number of times of compound, the number of times of compounds also has to do with now, let's say we're asked to compute for semi-annual and we have the time period to be caught, let's say, three years. How many semi-annuals do you have in a year? Two, right? So meaning that for us to get the number of times of compounding, it should be equal to what the compounding period, which is what semi-annual multiplying the time. And what was the compound? It was semi-annual. So that is two, right? Multiplying the time of what, three. And we are getting what, six. So that becomes what, six times. If we were to be cut out and we have what time to be what three years, then that should mean that it's going to be what four, because we have four quarters in a year, multiplying what the time which is what three years, and we are getting what 12 times. If we're compounded monthly, that will have been what for every every how many months you have in a year, that is 12 months, right? That will have been what 12 multiplying what three, and you are getting what 36 times. So always for you to get the number of what times, it is always your compounding period that's going to give you in the question, multiply by the time and get your compounding period. So let's take note of that. So this is how we also compute for the R and then the R. And that will help us to compute for our future value or the maturity value. So this is what we need to understand when it comes to compound interest. If you have any question, you can let me know. If you have any question, you can let me know. So that is all about compound interest in that line. Okay. So we can be given a similar question like this. Let's say we are asked to compute for a compound interest with the with the let's say with the present value or the loan value to be. So the loan value, let's say the loan value is let's say three thousand dollars. Okay, and the rate, the annual rate annual rate was given let's say um, let's say uh 15 percent okay and let's say we're asked to compound compounding period we have to compound it or quarterly you are asked to compound it compound it quarterly so quarterly 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 right and we have the time the time period for this loan supposed to be paying what in three years in three years time so how do you compute for our compound interest we said to get our compound interest it should be equal to our feature value or the maturity value minus the principal or the present what value same thing or the loan amount so before we can get our compound interest we must compute for our feature value right so therefore our feature value should be equal to the formula which is what the present value or the principal multiplying one plus R over 100 all to the power N. So let's deal with some of the parameters in here. So let's compute for R. What would be our R? Remember, we're asked to compute it quarterly, right? And the annual rate was for 15 pesos. So to get for our R, it's going to be the annual rate divided by what the compounding period. So we want to know the interest rate for quarterly. So that's going to be what 15% divided by what four and what are we going to get for dividing this by four 
today since my calculator my calculator let's see if i can bring my calculator here i'm coming hello guys you are welcome back to labi premium concept on this channel we share educational content ranging from mathematics to accounting okay so i have my calculator here i hope i can be heard loud and clear so i have my calculator here so we have come on what is this go so we have we have 15 divided by divided by 4 we are getting what 3 point what so that's going to give us 3.75 percent and that will become what our interest periodic interest rate for quarterly right okay so once we get that that is fine what will be the number of times the number of times of compound we said that should be equal to what the compounding period which is what quarterly multiplying the time and what are we getting for compounding period that was for quarterly so how many quarters we have in a year four so four multiplying or three then we are getting what 12 times so we are compounding or 12 times so therefore our future value should be equal to three thousand dollars into bracket one plus what three point seven five percent divided by hundred oh sorry there shouldn't be a percent because once i've bid hundred we don't have any percentage so divide by 100 or to the power of 12 because our n is 12 in this case so therefore we can write this as what 3000 then i can write this the whole of this as what 1.0375 i hope that is true or to the power 12 let me confirm one point sorry one plus 3.75 percent we get 10 where is my percentage oh come on where is it okay That's 0. Point. Oh, what am i typing okay so i think it's correct zero one point zero three one point zero three seven five so 1.0375 so once i'm able to get that then i can say that my future value is going to be is going to be multiplying what 3000 and we are getting what 3100 and what 12 point what five so 3112 point what five zero dollars right so once you get this it's going to be our future value therefore our uh, compound interest should be called to the future value minus the principal so what are we getting you can clearly see for me that the compound just what 112.50 right that's 112.50 here so here we have 3112.50 minus what 3000 so therefore our compound interest going to be what 112.50 dollars but there are, there are also an instances where there are also an instances where they will ask you to therefore what will be the compound interest for each year we have three years here so what are you going to do all i want to do is for us to know the compound interest for each year that should be what the total compound interest of 11205 divided by three and whatever you get becomes what the compound interest for each year right yeah so that will have been what one one two point five divided by what three and we get thirty seven point what five it can be examined on that or they can also ask you to compute for the compound for the quarterly and how many quarters were we having for the three years that was 12 so we take one one two point five divided by 12 and we get what the quarterly interest that would pay as a compound interest in that line you are good to go this is how we compute for what a compound interest so let's take note of that any question so that is that we need to know when it comes to compound interest 